The reading from our gospel today comes from the gospel of Matthew, chapter five, verses one through 12. It is the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It can be found on page four of the New Testament in the Pew Bibles. Let us listen for God's word. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Amen. Now, a few days ago, I received a postcard from a friend of mine. It was from London, and the picture on the front of the postcard is the front doors of All Saints Church in Fulham, in London. And as you can see, the picture of it is there projected on the screen. I don't know if you can tell, but there is a Bible verse that goes around the top of the door. And inscribed on those glass doors, it reads, blessed are the peacemakers. It is a reminder to all who enter that they are blessed by God as they gather as the body of Christ. And it's hard to see where you are, but you might notice that the etching on the glass is on both sides. And as people leave, they are also blessed by those same words, blessed to be peacemakers as they go out into the world. The people of God are blessed in their coming in and they're going out. Jesus has gathered his disciples around him up on the mountain to teach them, and in the process, he blesses them. Being on the mountain, well, that's a significant thing. That's something we should be paying attention to because it hearkens us back to when Moses was on Mount Sinai. Moses met God on Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments. And now Jesus is on a mountain, and he will reveal to the disciples a new law, a new way of life. Now the crowds were there too, right? They were following Jesus because he was teaching and healing, and the word got around. And so Jesus sat down on the mountain. He sat down taking the posture of a Jewish teacher, and he began teaching his disciples. And the crowds could not help overhearing what Jesus was teaching them, and we cannot help but hear what Jesus is teaching us today. Now, Professor Caroline Lewis points out that this is Jesus' first public act in the Gospels of Matthew that is recorded in detail. It does say in chapter four, just preceding this, that he's gone about the countryside healing and teaching, but now we get the details. And that first public act tells us a lot about what the gospel writer wants us to know about Jesus and who Jesus is. And she recounts how all four of the gospels introduce Jesus, right? It, that, that Jesus performs an exorcism in Mark as his inaugural act suggests that Mark sees Jesus as the ultimate boundary crosser. Indeed, God tears apart the boundaries that separated God from God's people, first at Jesus' baptism and then at Jesus' crucifixion. In Luke, 
Jesus returns to his hometown of Nazareth and preaches a sermon. She says, every intern's worst nightmare to return to your home church and preach a sermon. But the sermon is a summary of what his ministry will be and for whom. For Luke, Jesus is the savior of the marginalized, the outcast, the unseen. And the rejection at Nazareth calls out our willingness, unwillingness to imagine that God might be for someone other than ourselves. In John, the wedding at Cana is a sign of abundance. The point isn't that Jesus turned water into wine. The point is just how much wine, right? Six jars, 20 to 30 gallons each, filled to the brim of the best wine when you least expect it. It is a manifestation of an incarnation, if you will, of grace upon grace. Which then brings us to Matthew, she says. Who is Jesus for Matthew? The teacher of all righteousness. And whom does he teach? His disciples. And this means teaching is important. This means being a disciple is to be the consummate student, a learner. Being a disciple in Matthew demands that our first act of discipleship is to recognize Jesus as teacher. And so Jesus sits down on the mountain as any any rabbi would do with his disciples and Jesus gathers his disciples around him and he begins to teach and this is what he says. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven and blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. We often call these verses when we refer to them as the Beatitudes because of the word. Beatitude, it means blessed, supremely blessed. Now, there are beatitudes in the Hebrew scriptures. You'll find a lot of them in the Psalms. But these beatitudes that Jesus proclaims, they sit firmly in his Jewish tradition. And so this Jewish teacher, Jesus, sits down with his disciples, and the first thing their teacher says to these disciples is about those who are blessed. And he concludes with, blessed are you. The first thing, the first thing he teaches is about blessing. The first thing he says to us as disciples is about blessing. Blessed are you. Now, Caroline Lewis talks about the word blessed in this way. She says, note, being blessed is not just for the sake of potential joy but also for the sake of making it through that which will be difficult, right? It's not just about being happy. Professor Alice McKenzie adds, this blessedness describes a happiness that comes from a right relationship with God, rather than the emotional bliss or good fortune, as the word is normally used in everyday conversation. Jesus begins his teaching by telling his disciples of every age, you are blessed. And so the disciples are called blessed by Jesus. They are called also to recognize the blessedness of others. The disciples are not the only ones who are blessed in our scripture reading for today. And as 
as we, disciples of Jesus Christ, are called blessed by Jesus, we are called. We are called to recognize the blessedness of others. We are not the only ones who are blessed. And the others Jesus names turns the world upside down. They aren't the powerful, the influential, the movers and shakers of society, right? It's, it's the foolishness of the cross that Paul talks about here. Jesus lifts up the poor in spirit, the meek, the ones who grieve, the merciful, the ones who seek to make peace. And note that they are blessed now. Not in some future time, they're blessed now. Jesus lifts these people up and points to them as people who are blessed by God. He promises them that this present suffering is not all there is. He promises that their citizenship is in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus unexpectedly lifts up the humble and downtrodden in society as the, one, the ones who have hope. And Jesus tells the disciples, Jesus tells us that these people are blessed. And then he says, blessed are you. Now, Pastor Janet Hunt wondered on her blog if she could take these words of Jesus to heart and see if she could recognize the reign of God as expressed in the Beatitudes in her daily life. So she looked at the Beatitudes as a roadmap for daily living, and here's what happened. These are her words. I listened to a woman whose voice broke as she prayed for a friend who was suffering far from home. Blessed are those who mourn. I heard another speak of patience needed and waiting for seeds of mission to take root and grow in a congregation which is relatively new to her. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I stood by and watched the director of our local homeless shelter give her full attention to a young man who towered over her. He was working on his self-esteem, and she stood still and said to him, You look happy. <coughs> blessed are the poor in spirit, and oh, blessed are the merciful. She said, I shared a meal with a woman who has given her life to fighting for racial justice and who has suffered the consequences of following this call in the form of estrangement from loved ones, disdain from neighbors and co-workers, and death threats from strangers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. I listened to one, she says, whose father forced him to attend the March on Washington in 1963 as he recounted listening to Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream through the eyes and ears of the 17-year-old boy that he was then. And oh, I heard him speak of how far we have come and how far we have to go. <coughs> Blessed are the peacemakers. I thanked a child who got up early and made chocolate chip muffins from scratch as a gift to guests who would gather at the local Islamic center, the center of her faith community, for a day of learning about hospitality, and I saw her eyes light up with joy. Blessed are the pure in heart. And these are just what I have witnessed since Wednesday, she concludes. The Beatitudes can serve as our roadmap, too. Pastor Christine Chikoyan helps us put this roadmap in perspective. She says, the path that Jesus offers may not initially look as appealing, but the farther down the road of faith one travels, the more truth one finds. We discover that humility, unlike power, needs no defense. We realize righteousness, doing the right thing, is its own reward. We find that a pure heart is much easier to live with than one filled with jealousy or resentment or cynicism. Step by step, we learn that following Jesus, even if we are persecuted for it, leads to a joy that nothing can take away. 
Jesus begins teaching his disciples from this place. The poor in spirit are blessed. The grieving are blessed. The merciful are blessed. The ones who seek justice and righteousness are blessed. And the peacemakers are blessed. You are blessed. God has blessed you. You are a child of God, a disciple of Jesus Christ. God has blessed you so that you may do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with our God, as the prophet says. Consider your call, writes Paul. Consider your call because the world needs you. The blessed you that God created you to be. You are blessed to embody the love of Christ. You are blessed to seek diligently after righteousness. You are blessed to see those who are oppressed, downtrodden, and strangers in our midst. The world needs you to do your thing, your one blessed thing to help bring the kingdom of God to the here and now. So what is it you have been made a blessing for? Who is it that you have been made a blessing for? President of Lutheran Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, David Lose, recalls this story. When I was in graduate school, one of my teachers, Dr. Cleo LaRue, would regularly address me as Dr. Lose. Eventually, it made me uncomfortable enough that I said to him, but Dr. LaRue, I haven't earned my doctorate yet. I don't think you should call me that. Dr. Lose, he patiently responded, in the African-American church, we are not content to call you what you are, but instead call you what we believe you will be. Now maybe you're thinking to yourself, I can't do that. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't have enough talent or ability. I don't possess the courage it takes. You're blessed. You are blessed. You are blessed to be a blessing. You are a child of God created in the image of the creator of love itself. So when you can't quite see how you will bless the world, we will call you what we believe you to be. We have been gathered together as the people of God, blessed by God. The world needs us. The world needs the love of Christ. The love needs the justice of Christ. Let us go from here into the world recognizing the blessedness of others as we do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with our God. Now, I'd like you to do something for me. I'd like you to stand up for a minute and be blessed. I want you to receive a blessing. And in order to do that, I want you to either hold hands or put your hand on the shoulder of someone next to you. All right, receive this blessing. May God give you grace never to sell yourself short. May God give you grace to risk something big for something good. And may God give you grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. Friends, you are blessed by our loving and faithful God. May it be so. May it be so. Amen. You may be seated. Um.